Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Thursday, May 14th. I'm Wayne Pratt. St. Louis Mayor Lida Krusen is giving more hints about reopening plans in the city. She says the second phase of the process is still weeks away, but she is not providing specifics about what would be involved in phase two. Krusen also says a decision on allowing gyms and yoga studios to reopen is also weeks away. Illinois' governor says he does not have sympathy for, quote, those so intent on disregarding science and logic. The comment by J.B. Pritzker is directed at local officials who are allowing non-essential businesses to reopen while a statewide stay-at-home order remains in effect. Madison County is restarting its economy, and 11 central Illinois counties are going ahead with a faster reopening than outlined in the governor's plan. A rare inflammatory syndrome affecting some children with coronavirus has appeared in a small number of cases at Missouri hospitals. A spokeswoman for St. Louis Children's Hospital says, quote, a few children with the virus and symptoms similar to Kawasaki disease have been treated. She did not give information on the exact number or other details. Two St. Louis County malls plan to reopen Monday with coronavirus guidelines in place. West County Center and South County Center will open their doors. Individual stores and restaurants can decide to remain closed. Both malls are owned by Tennessee-based CBL properties. Here are the numbers. There have been more than 10,000 cases in Missouri out of nearly 127,000 tests. The state reports more than 540 deaths. Illinois officials are reporting the largest one-day death total since the outbreak started, 192. That brings the total number of deaths during the pandemic in Illinois to about 3,800. There have been more than 84,000 positive results out of nearly 490,000 tests. In just a few minutes, St. Louis Public Radio's Rachel Littman reports on how local police and fire departments are adapting to the coronavirus. As we mentioned, many Illinois counties are planning to allow businesses to reopen sooner than outlined in Governor J.B. Pritzker's economic restart plan. That includes Madison County. But as St. Louis Public Radio's Eric Schmidt reports, many will not immediately welcome people back through their doors. Madison County's new guidelines let restaurants and bars immediately operate at 25% capacity and churches at 50% capacity. But just because they can doesn't mean they will. Danny Holliday is a pastor at the Victory Baptist Church in Alton. He says he supports the county's plan, but won't immediately open his church. I'm 70, I'm black, and I have diabetes. A significant number of, of the members of my church are older also. So I don't have a plan right now of when I would ask to reopen. Holiday was part of the committee in Madison County that sought ideas for how to reopen its economy. He says he pushed the county to reopen so local businesses could begin to recover from closing. In Belleville, I'm Eric Schmid, St. Louis Public Radio. St. Louis area hospitals are beginning to schedule elective surgeries once again. That comes two months after canceling non-emergency procedures because of the pandemic. SSM Health Hospitals in the region have resumed scheduling surgeries for non-emergency patients. Samir Siddiqui is a surgeon at St. Louis University Hospital. He says the hospital is taking a phased-in approach and treating patients with diseases such as serious cancers first. What's going to change now is that we have a significant number of patients that we've delayed for a period of weeks. And if we delay much longer, their situation is going to become more urgent. Canceling elective procedures dealt a huge financial blow to health systems. All three major hospital chains in the region have laid off and furloughed workers because of the outbreak. Two-thirds of people who visit Kranzberg Arts Foundation venues say they will not feel comfortable returning until there is a coronavirus vaccine. The organization has asked patrons what it would take for them to return to venues and galleries. Many of the nearly 1,000 respondents to a survey say they also want to see smaller crowds. Communications Director Andrew Warshower says the foundation will use the survey and input from public health experts 
to determine how it will reopen venues. Clearly, the majority of people, in addition to wanting a vaccine, want to be able to enjoy the arts with this kind of social distancing policy. The foundation is considering new policies, including ticket scanning that does not involve any contact and daily temperature tests for casts and crew. In other news, Missouri is planning to add feral hogs to a program that allows hunters to donate meat to food pantries. St. Louis Public Radio's Jonathan All reports the state is doubling the amount of money going to that initiative. Part of the budget bill headed to Governor Parson would expand the Share the Harvest program to include feral hogs. The state will now pay processors to prepare deer and hogs donated by hunters for local food banks. Kurt Hobson of Hobson's Butcher Block and Licking supports the idea, but warns some of the wild pigs don't make for prime cuts. People's got to understand, if they go out here and kill an old boar hog, that meat is not going to be good. It's going to stink. Their, their meat is pretty rank. But Hobson says young feral hogs can provide quality steaks and bacon, and the less desirable ones will still make good sausage. In Rolla, I'm Jonathan All, St. Louis Public Radio. The highly contagious coronavirus has forced police and fire departments to change the way they interact with the public. St. Louis Public Radio's Rachel Littman examines how those departments throughout the region are keeping their members safe. St. Louis Fire Chief Dennis Jankerson became aware of the virus because of a family vacation to Italy. He started paying closer attention to international news in November, at first to keep track of the aftermath of flooding in Venice. Then you saw some of the rumors about a virus in in China, then, then, then the virus is here. So I continued to track it basically by staying up with the world events. We were watching this and it it started ballooning fairly quickly. On January 24th, despite there being just one confirmed case of COVID-19 in the United States, Jankerson sent a health alert to the department's nearly 800 employees. And they received information relative to the COVID-19 signs and symptoms and basically gave them preliminary instructions on how to protect the patients and how to protect themselves. Chief Quentin Randolph of the Northeast Ambulance and Fire Protection District also started to pay attention in January. His men and women serve 17 municipalities around the University of Missouri, St. Louis. We were actually uh, monitoring the impact on the hospitals and seeing the uptick in our call load and the symptoms that, that people were displaying. So that raised the eyebrow to that we need to uh, raise up our level of PPE PPE stands for personal protective equipment. In Randolph's department, raising the level means all medical calls require masks and gloves. On calls for shortness of breath or to an address with a known coronavirus case, gowns are worn as well. Jankerson now requires full protective gear on all medical calls. We're not being as uh, touchy-feely. You know, part of what we do, if, if somebody's injured or in an area, you know, in a car accident, you know, just that simple touch has a comforting effect. We can't do that now. Police departments have had to adapt, too. Officers are wearing masks and gloves, and the cars are being professionally disinfected on a regular basis. Many departments are taking more reports over the phone, only responding in person to calls for serious crimes like assaults and homicides. Right now, supplies of masks, gowns, and gloves are fairly stable, and Jankerson and other chiefs say they trust their supply divisions to do what's necessary to keep the gear coming. The virus has not devastated the region's police and fire departments in the way it has in cities like New York and Chicago, but there have been cases here. A St. Louis police officer spent more than three weeks in the ICU with COVID-19. Two of Randolph's men got sick, one seriously enough to be hospitalized. I had to come in, have crew meetings, and let everybody know that this particular individual has succumbed to the illness and he's now in the ICU on the vent. It's shocking when you are the ones that are delivering the care. Thankfully, Randolph says that employee is home recovering, and he says despite the exposures, he has been able to keep up the necessary manpower. Missouri is one of a few states that have made it easier for first responders who come down with COVID-19 to get workers' compensation. But labor lawyer Will Aitchison, who focuses on public safety workplace issues, says that won't help with the mental health aspect. You see elevated uh, suicide rates for law enforcement and firefighters before the pandemic. You'll see it after the pandemic. And it is our role as their employers to make sure that they get not just the treatment 
that they need, but the education that they need uh, in order to be more resilient in these circumstances. Adding to the anxiety is the pressure that the pandemic is putting on state and local budgets. Randolph isn't too worried about that for now. We know that uh, later on down the road, there may be some uh, budgetary issues, but at the same time, there are some budgetary items that were frozen so we can reallocate funds. Jankerson also expects to avoid cuts in St. Louis, but knows he likely won't get more money than he did last year. First responders are used to adapting as new threats emerge. Jankerson remembers SARS and H1N1. But he acknowledges that COVID-19 has brought a new set of challenges for the department and for everyone. St. Louis is a resilient town, you know, and, you know, we see it with the people that we're, you know, responding to. Stay the course, he says. We're almost there. I'm Rachel Lippman, St. Louis Public Radio. Our Fred Ehrlich edited that report. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio, music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. From the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.